Okay, great. So I think it's 20 past. So thank you everyone. We're so excited that you could be here with us today. We have a really exciting um, panel uh, session with some amazing uh, presenters for you today. Um, in addition, we also will have a lot of interactive sessions for you. Now I'm just going to start the session. This session is on uh, alternative care in, in in refugee settings um, in the context of COVID. So we're very excited um, to have so many of you with us today. I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Amanda Melville. I'm the senior advisor um, from UNHCR on child protection. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Marion, to introduce herself. Over to you, Marion. Thank you very much, Amanda. So my name's Marion Mwebi. Uh, working with Plan International in Tanzania, and I'm so excited to be with you today. And uh, looking at the participants who have just joined, we are looking forward to very fruitful discussions and engagements. Thank you. Excellent. And so now I'll hand over to Jacob to introduce yourself. Over to you, Jacob. Hello. Hello, everyone. This is Jacob from Oxus Bar. Jacob, you're on mute, sorry. Hello everyone, this is Jacob and I'm from Bangladesh and uh, working in Cox's Bazaar uh, in, uh, for the Rohingya refugee and leading the child protection program of Save the Children here in Cox's Bazaar. So I'm also uh, with uh, Amanda and Marie and I'm also excited and, and excitingly looking forward to uh, hear from all of you and have a good time uh, to learn together and share, share some of our experience and some of the insights that we have gained through our experience. So looking forward to it. Over. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. And now I'll hand over to Cliff. Uh, Cliff. Over to you, Cliff. Hi, everyone. My name is Cliff. Uh, I work with Amanda in the Child Protection Unit at UNHCR. Um, so uh, in the team, I am a focal point for uh, uh, unaccompanied separate children, alternative care, and child-friendly procedures. So as, as everybody else said, I'm quite excited myself uh, to engage, uh, to discuss, and to identify some uh, great solutions moving forward. Great. Thanks, Cliff. So we have some really experienced uh, presenters who've worked all over the world uh, in refugee settings on alternative care. And I'm sure some of you in the in in as our participants also have some some amazing experience to share. Um, so I just wanted to start maybe with a, a few housekeeping issues. So it would be great if you could, uh, first of all, if you could just uh, introduce yourself in the chat. Just put your name and so we know who's with us. We recognize some of the names, but not everyone. We have some new friends with us today. Um, so that would be great. The second thing is just when you go into, um, when, it, when you are speaking in the, in the groups, it would be great if you could just remember to put on your video um, so that colleagues can see you. It helps with the, helps with the, the discussion and to make it more fluid. Um, and so basically that's, that's the key things. I'm going to just start by showing, um, uh, uh, doing a few introductory remarks. Sorry. Excuse me. So the first thing I just wanted to say is that if everybody could please, um, we pop, pop the Mentimeter in the chat so while I'm doing these introductory remarks, it would be great if you could also, um, you know, go to the Mentimeter and, um, and enter your responses in the Mentimeter at the same time, for those of you who like multitasking. Uh, okay, so let me start. So as, you, as I've already said, this is the, the se session on alternative care and refugee settings during COVID. Um, and what is the objective of this session? So the objective of the session is to take stock of the specific risks and challenges related to alternative care for refugees, refugee unaccompanied and separated children during COVID-19, and to identify together um, key actions to address these issues. So I just wanted to remind us all that one of the key guiding, guiding standards for us uh, when we're working on alternative care, whether it's in refugee settings or other settings, 
is the Alliance Standard on Alternative Care number 19. So you can see down here, just a small reminder that most of our work when we're talking about alternative care um, as part of the, the COVID response is really grounded in the minimum standard and the relevant um, uh, standard related to alternative care. So what's the agenda today? So first of all, we're going to be exploring the issues and challenges. And here we have the opportunity, we'll, we'll be having three parallel um, groups. So you get to choose which group you've, you, you will join. Either you will be joining um, Cliff, who will be talking about access to asylum and registration procedures as a precursor to re alternative care and family reunification, looking at a global perspective on these issues. Um, otherwise, the other alternative is you'll be joining uh, Marion to talk about engaging communities for alternative care. Um, and lastly, the other option is to be uh, joining Jacob to talk about enhancing coordination between sectors to strengthen alternative care in Cox's Bazaar. So these three sessions will be run in parallel. You will be randomly assigned to, to one of the groups and basically we'll be, give you the opportunity to play play the videos that have been recorded and then to facilitate, each of the presenters will facilitate a discussion with the, with the participants in their group. Basically, as a result of that, we'll come back into plenary and we'll do a debriefing. What were the key lessons learned and, and issues identified? And then we're going to have breakout groups where we're going to really um, delve down into the issue of what are the actual solution to some of the challenges that we've identified um, and some of the responsibilities and then a debriefing and challenges. So just to set the scenes, I want to provide, um, I want to provide you a, sorry, I want to provide you a bit of a context to what we're talking about. Um, so it's really important for, for us as UNHCR just to highlight that we have the highest level of forced displacement globally ever. Almost 80 million people are, were forcibly displaced at the end of 2019 as a result of uh, persecution, conflict, violence, human rights, or, or other events. And of these, 26 uh, million were refugees. Uh, there's 20 million under UNHCR's mandate and just over, just under 6 million under, under UNRWA's mandate of Palestinian refugees. Then we have a huge amount of, uh, of internally displaced people, uh, 45 million. Um, and then we have another, another uh, 4 million asylum seekers globally and just under 4 million Venezuelans dis displaced. So within that, we see that there are uh, approximately 40% or between 30 and 34 million um, uh, dis forcibly displaced children below the age of 18. So these are, these are really a huge number. Um, of that, within that, you have about 50% uh, of refugees. So there's a higher percentage of refugees, uh, children, uh, than um, children in the IDP population. And you can see here, finally, within that, we have a, huge, uh, a very significant number of unaccompanied and separated children. Um, the figures that you see are, are on the right there are, are basically showing the trend in, in identified unaccompanied and separated children seeking asylum over the last 10 years. Obviously, there was a peak in 2015. This reflects the actually this this graph is a uh, reflects the peak in us being globally able to identify and record those numbers because that was the peak of the European crisis. But of course, there are large, large numbers of unaccompanied and separated children globally um, who are at risk, um, who are not necessarily reflected in these figures um, that all of you are working with in the field. So um, before we go into the discussion, and these are the groups that we'll be discussing. We just wanted to, if I can ask uh, Jessica to display, I will stop sharing, if you can display the results of the Mentimeter. If people haven't had a chance, could you uh, just go back to the Mentimeter and, um, and enter your responses to the question there? Jessica, could you display the Mentimeter? Okay, we can just... Would you be able to make it a little larger, Jessica?
Okay, so Jessica, if you can re-enter the Mentimeter and also stop it scrolling, if it would be great. Okay, great. So let's see, um, as we see, so what are some of, some of the key issues that have been identified by participants? Uh, Jessica, could you just make it bigger again? Okay, great. So we see here some of the key issues that have been identified. Options for integrating um, uh, refugee children within national child protection systems. That's a very important how do we issue. How do we make sure that refugee children are really integrated within uh, national systems uh, for alternative care? And also very importantly, how do those uh, systems, how do we make sure that those systems are actually responsive to the specific needs of of, of uh, refugee children. Independent living options for alternate, for adolescents. This is a very important point. In what settings is it appropriate for, uh, for and under what conditions is supported and supervised independent living appropriate? Adolescents and alternative care uh, and temporary foster care as a solution to reception centres, indeed. One of the key issues we see is that children are refugee children are often kept in in substandard refugee uh, reception centers for way too long. So how can we support um, foster care, temporary foster care as an alternative to keeping unaccompanied children in particular in overcrowded reception centers? Okay. Guidance for exploring non-institutional alternative care for abused and neglected children in urban um, settings. This is an excellent point. How can we ensure that we can, when children need to be removed because they're not safe in their families or in, in the living situation, how can we make sure that they have um, alternative family-based alternative care, which is safe um, when you have when you may not uh, when you may have the perpetrators at large? Great. How alternative care is, uh, yes. So, how, ah, very interesting point from, from a colleague. How has alternative care been uh, able to protect or put children at risk during pandemics, particularly in non-traditional humanitarian contexts? This is a very important point because we've seen that um, COVID has affected uh, settings which have been largely uh, non-humanitarian. So how do we make sure that we're able to use the learning in humanitarian settings to address that? Great. Okay, next point. Gender considerations. Yes, indeed. So these are some of the things that are very important for us to address the needs of boys and girls, and um, particularly as they get older, are often quite different, and the risks and, and options facing them uh, have to be really addressed in our session. Okay. How the full spectrum of art alternative care works in a refugee setting. I think, again, very important point to highlight. We do need a range of options because no one uh, model of alternative care will fit all children. So how do we make sure we have different options and make an assessment based on the specific situation and needs and best interests of the child? Okay. So uh, we can keep the, the, maybe what we can do is we'll keep those the, that running for a little bit. Um, and before we break into groups, I just want to give our, uh, our, our presenters a chance to say a few words about the, the, intra, the, the issue they'll be talking about. So if I can hand to you, back to you, Marion, would you be able to give a quick summary of, of the presentation that you're going to be making? Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and it's very interesting to see the um, feedback and the, some of the areas that have been highlighted by the participants. And uh, most of them are the issues that we are going to focus on today. So for, um, for the presentation today, I would uh, like to focus more on uh, community engagement and participation in provision of alternative care. As we have seen from the uh, questions that have been raised, during pandemic, there are other uh, additional risks that emerge which places even uh, the children already in existing care arrangements at more risk. 
but also during a pandemic such as COVID-19, uh, there are other considerations, for example, additional caseload of children who usually are not provided with alternative care. For example, uh, orphans and vulnerable children whose parents uh, might be taken to isolation or quarantine centers due to COVID, but also children in conflict and in contact with the law, uh, the risk of child survivors uh, who can be identified during this phase. Uh, there is also an issue that has been highlighted about child-headed households, but also in the independent living. How do we ensure that we put on measures and strategies to continue supervising and supporting children in existing care arrangements? But how do we uh, coordinate effectively with communities, other actors, uh, to be able to provide alternative care options for the, this additional uh, caseload of children. So basically that is what we'll be looking at today. And uh, um, basically I'll also be able to share how we did it in, uh, in Tanzania, in the Kigoma refugee operations, which is also a refugee setting. And it's also going to be interesting to note how we have also worked with the government to ensure that children are provided with alternative care uh, support. So basically, that is a summary, and I'm looking forward to share more on this. Thank you. Right, Marianne. I mean, it sounds very, uh, very fascinating. So I'm sure colleagues will have difficulty to choose. Um, over to you, Jacob, for a, a very short, if you wouldn't mind, like, you know, 30 second summary of, of the of the issue you're going to be focused on in your group. Oh, sure. Uh, I will try my best. So uh, definitely uh, the presentation that uh, uh, the participants will be able to see in a few minutes is that uh, it's on uh, preparing for unaccompanied and separated children in health facilities. So the, the work that we have done con uh, in con uh, coordination with uh, the child protection subsector here in Cox's Bazar and also health uh, actors and um, combinedly with IOM, UNHCR, reading from Save the Children, we actually developed a, a guideline for this one, and we are going to uh, share uh, some of the highlights of that, uh, uh, you know, uh, guide, uh, ex experience. And definitely, we hope that participants will have some good understanding and also good, uh, will raise some good questions for further discussion. So, looking forward to it. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jacob. And now, Cliff, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the specific situation uh, that COVID has posed uh, in relation to uh, children who arrived uh, prior to their parents uh, are now stuck in uh, reception centers, um, the inability or restrictions uh, of uh, asylum procedures being implemented, registration procedures being implemented means um, identifying appropriate alternative care quickly and uh, in timely fashion uh, is also impacted because of COVID-19. So uh, I'll make some presentations around that and uh, suggest some uh, ideas for us to uh, explore further in, uh, in our group. Great, thank you very much. So what we're going to do now is split you, for those of you who are actually uh, participating with us, uh, in the group, we're going to split you into three different groups where your presenter will be displaying their video and then you'll have a chance to interact. Uh, we have basically until, for this session, we have basically until four o'clock and then we'll be taking a break. So um, you'll receive a one minute notification uh, and then you'll have a chance to have a, a, a 10 minute break and then we'll come back here into the plenary um, at 4.10 uh, Geneva time. So thank you very much. I'll hand you over. And for those of you who are watching uh, live on Facebook, stay with us and we'll be showing the videos here. Thank you. Great, Amanda, I'm gonna send everyone now. So we've got 20 minutes. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. So welcome back everyone uh, from the, the group discussion that you've had. What we're going to do now, just to remind you, is that you will have had a chance to have some, to watch the video um, in, in, in your breakout groups and we're going to hear, have a, a kind of interactive discussion with the presenters. So we have Jacob, Marion and Cliff with us. So to start with, Jacob, I'd like to turn to you. 
I know that you were you, your work and, and the discussion focused very much on how child protection and health actors should work to protect um, and provide alternative care for separated and unaccompanied children in the COVID uh, situation. Could you tell us a bit more about, about that discussion and some of the key recommendations, issues and recommendations that came out? Over to you, Jacob. Thank you very much. Uh, in, uh, we were in uh, room number two and in our group, uh, there were participants from Malaysia, Ethiopia, and Kenya, among others. Several issues came up in our uh, presentation. For example, in Malaysia, refugee children often face difficulties accessing state alternative care services. Another issue we highlighted was the need for coordination between health and child protection actors early on, the, uh, on in the response. Good practices was recognized, especially around one, having strong referral pathways and disseminating dignity kits in Malaysia. And number two was uh, training carers in the quarantine center to provide care for unaccompanied children. One unaddressed question was around how to care for the specific needs of children with disabilities. This issue was not addressed uh, during the discussion. So that's from uh, the group that we were together in group, uh, room two. Excellent. Thank you, Jacob. So I just wonder, it's a very important point that you've, you, you've raised about the issue of how we, how we support appropriately uh, children with disabilities. Marianne and Cliff, did you, did in your group discussion, maybe I'll we'll turn to Marianne, did you have any uh, discussion either on the issue of how to work with health actors um, or on the issue of how to make sure that we are inclusive and responsive to the needs of children with disabilities? Uh, thank you very much. So in my group also that issue came up and one of the issues that came, uh, came up is uh, in some contexts or settings, uh, child protection actors experience some challenges in coordinating with our uh, health partners. But uh, in Tanzania, we did share one of the examples uh, before even COVID, COVID, we had a very robust uh, coordination and um, coordination mechanism with all uh, sectors. So what helped us is uh, all of us who were able to come together on a weekly basis, uh, discuss emerging, uh, emerging challenges, emerging issues, and how we could uh, best address them. For example, uh, the issue of um, uh, refugees having big families, and in the event there is a su suspected case, uh, this large family of about 10, uh, 10 people, how could they be moved so we, together with the health partners, wash partners, shelter, we were able to agree on some of the measures that we could take. So um, just to reiterate the point that he has mentioned, uh, during disease outbreaks such as COVID, it's very important uh, for all the mechanisms, all the coordination to be reactivated and uh, agree on mechanisms to ensure that we are addressing emerging issues. Thank you. Excellent, great. So Cliff, over to you. Did you have any, in your discussions, any, any um, reflections on the issue of how to work with health actors? Um, no, unfortunately, uh, we didn't go into that specificities uh, with regard to health actors or uh, even uh, discussions around uh, children with uh, specific needs such as uh, children with disabilities. But uh, what was interesting, however, was uh, um, the, the group members uh, felt that uh, where national systems have been impacted by COVID-19 with uh, uh, reduced uh, staffing, reduced mobility and so on, uh, the first step is to, to focus on uh, life-saving intervention. Even if uh, children are stranded or stuck in uh, reception facilities, um, the focus should be on ensuring uh, they are receiving the immediate uh, support that they need uh, so that their life is uh, better um, in those centers, as well as making sure that there are monitoring systems in place. Uh, so this is uh, what the group highlighted in relation to uh, this coordinated approach. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, so I think you've really highlighted a number of key issues, um, including the importance of focusing on life-saving um, approaches, ensuring um, appropriate coordination. Marianne, I know that your group was really focused on the role of communities. Would you be able to say a few words about how, um, you know, what were some of the challenges and opportunities of working with communities and how you really managed to, to address that? 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, in my group, we focused on community engagement in provision of alternative care uh, during COVID. And uh, we did have an opportunity to share some of the best practices, some of the things that we did. Um, if I can start, some of the things that uh, we looked at, uh, it's important to be able to, be, uh, to build on the existing community relationship. So for example, for us, Plan International, we had uh, a good working relationship with communities across all the three camps. And with that engagement, the communities were able to understand uh, the CP risks that, uh, we, uh, that, that were the CP risks during COVID, but also what was expected. So for example, the existing foster parents were able even to recommend uh, some of the carers that they felt could be trained and oriented because they are good role models within the community. And we also had the child protection committees that we had already trained and built their capacity even before COVID, who are able to come in and say, yes, in the event that there's a, a child who need alternative care, uh, I'll, be able to, I'll be able to support. So the trainings and orientation, we found it very helpful, not only to look at from the child protection perspective, but also looking at the health risks because uh, the pandemic COVID-19 was about health risks. So how we were able to work with um, our health colleagues uh, to be able also to orient them from the health perspective. What are some of the things that we needed to do? So jointly, we were able to develop IPC criteria, like the do's and don'ts. And uh, this was translated into local language, which was very, very helpful because when, it, I mean, it was in local language and we were able to print, laminate, so they, they had it and it became one of the tools uh, that they had. Another thing that really helped us is in terms of working with the community structures. And we agreed on uh, a revised uh, referral pathway where we had to put even some standby community members, for example, child protection committees, some leadership of foster parents, so that in the event we have a quick case, we could call them. Um, one of the things also that helped us is the UNHCR was able also to give us some uh, additional funds because in the refugee camps, there are some restrictions in terms of refugees owning a phone. So UNHCR was able to give us some additional funds which were distributed to some of the standby foster parents. And we provided some airtime, uh, some uh, PPE kits, which was also very, very helpful. So I can really say that many sectors, due to the limited access into the camps, uh, we're able to rely more on the community structures. And this is one of the areas we are calling on, on more investment to be able to ensure that the communities, the structures are continuously supported to be able to respond uh, on this kind of uh, pandemic should we have another outbreak uh, in the future. So for us, we, were, we are a bit lucky the situation has gone a bit down, but we continue implementing both COVID-19 measures and uh, normal programming. Uh, another thing that I can highlight on community uh, level programming is the importance of having, uh, I mean, having feedback mechanisms. So for us here, we have interagency child protection help desks, which helps in terms of uh, disseminating like issues from one sector to the other. So the child protection help desk remained uh, operational, which helped us to get even the feedback and feel from communities children who needed uh, cross-border family tracing and unification, but also support to children who are, uh, children and caregivers who are repatriating. So in our com context, it was a bit complex, but all this I can highlight that the feedback mechanism is also key even when we have disease outbreak. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. I think that your, your point is really crucial. I mean, Communities are the first in every setting, but particularly in refugee settings, to really take care of, uh, of the children. Um, and, and many families will, whether relatives or, or, or not relatives, will spontaneously take in children. And it's really our responsibility to support and, and, and to ensure that those families are really equipped and supported to continue that in, the, in what are these very difficult times. So it was really fascinating to hear the practical ways in which you've really you know, engaged with communities as genuine partners and as the first line responders when it comes to caring for, 
for uh, unaccompanied and separated children. Excellent. So I want to turn now to Cliff. Um, Cliff, could you say a few words about um, the issue of access to family reunification and national child protection systems and how those have been affected during the COVID times? Yeah, so in, in our group, uh, there was a general agreement that uh, uh, the, the measures that have been put in place uh, does uh, lead to delays in uh, identifying family uh, tracing opportunities, uh, placement of uh, children in alternative care as well. Um, but, uh, but I guess um, going beyond access to uh, asylum procedures and registration, uh, colleagues also mentioned that uh, uh, there's also been an effect on the ability of the national authorities to uh, renew or to uh, distribute uh, identification documents, uh, which then uh, also prevents uh, both carers as well as uh, children uh, who arrive uh, alone uh, or living uh, in peer uh, groups uh, are not able to uh, receive uh, or access services uh, or assistance. Uh, so this is uh, one of the main challenges also uh, identified. And uh, we, we also heard from uh, Ethiopia where, uh, especially in Bella region uh, where uh, the government uh, imposed uh, very strict procedures. So uh, large numbers of uh, refugees, including uh, uh, unaccompanied children and separated children uh, living with uh, relatives, um, were kept in uh, reception centers for a prolonged period of time. Uh, so in, uh, in terms of addressing this or to ease the burden, uh, uh, actors have uh, worked uh, uh, collectively to uh, advocate for uh, access and also uh, moving moving people out of reception centers into camp settings uh, where services would be uh, better uh, in those locations. Uh, we also heard um, uh, that uh, the, an interesting positive scenario, uh, which we heard from uh, El Salvador, where uh, while uh, the government uh, imposed very uh, strict measures uh, and moved uh, all the people who are being repatriated or children, uh, individuals in mixed migration situations into quarantine centers, unaccompanied children were uh, allowed to remain in uh, government hosted hotel like uh, care arrangements, uh, although not optimal in terms of family based care, uh, the conditions were better and uh, actors were able to provide uh, services there. Uh, I see that Hani has also uh, inquired about uh, what do we mean by uh, life saving interventions. Uh, so uh, we, we heard from uh, the participants that uh, this means uh, ensuring that uh, um, the immediate food and uh, uh, medical needs are being met, uh, but also uh, in so doing, um, ensuring that uh, families who are caring for uh, unaccompanied uh, children and uh, families who are caring for their own children are not forced to separate. So these are some of the key points that we heard uh, in the team. On mute now. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Yes, it's very important. I think what we see is the longer that this economic crisis and the deeper the economic crisis uh, goes on, the more it's going to strain families' ability to be able to care for and, and, and feed an extra mouth. And so the prevention of, of family of separation, secondary separation, by actually providing that economic uh, uh, support to families is so crucial in preventing um, the separ further separation of, of children from the families in which they're staying. staying. So very well um, highlighted. Let's just take a few last questions before we move into our group work. Um, so I see that, let's see what here we, so we have a question from um, Rhoda, Charlotte, in the Kugama region, there's interagency feedback mechanisms and plan uh, plan international managed feedback mechanisms. Both were operational during the pandemic. So that sounds more like a, a comment. Could you say a, a bit about how those feedback mechanisms worked? Hi. <laughs> Hi, thank you. No, I think I'll leave it to Marion to respond, but I was actually just responding to a question from Charlotte, and she was asking whether the feedback mechanisms were uh, planned international managed or a partnership. So I was responding to that, but Marion, if you'd like to uh, take on that from Amanda, that would be nice. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Amanda and, uh, and Rhoda. So in terms of the uh, feedback mechanisms, as I highlighted uh, previously, it's actually interagency. So plan international feedback offices are seconded uh, to that interagency help desk. Uh, which remained operational. And basically what they do is they get feedback and information from uh, community members, including children and ad adolescents. There is a database that is shared on a weekly basis. Uh, of course, it, while maintaining the information uh, sharing and data protection principles where issues are channeled. For example, if it's issues to do with the protection, they're channeled to the protection uh, working group. Uh, if it's issues uh, to do about maybe a, a grievance from community, so they're channeled uh, to different sectors for follow-up. And uh, there is timeline for feedback where all organizations are able to feed in and the same feedback is able to be provided to communities. Even though uh, there is those help desks, also at community level, there are other mechanisms on how uh, we collect information from, uh, from community members. So there is also like rotational child uh, friendly help desks, uh, which are uh, based at the camp level, which keep on, uh, which have moved like from zone to zone. And the purpose is to uh, continuously engage communities to get feedback and channel it to ensure that um, we are putting into consideration the feedback that is coming from communities to also inform decision making to address some of the emerging gaps from beneficiaries. So for the one that we highlighted, yes, it's interagency plan sits there and helps to channel uh, issues to different sectors and different working groups. Thank you. Great, thanks, Marianne. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to move into some breakout rooms. So thank you, Jessica, for putting the 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 breakout rooms up there. I'm just going to share with you in the chat, so everybody has it, the question for discussion. What we're going to do now is we'll break you into, into um, uh, small groups. And in those small groups that you'll be able to discuss and, and come up with a number of key recommendations for scaling up alternative care in refugee settings and addressing the specific challenges uh, identified by COVID. So just a couple of kind of suggestions as you go into your small groups. First of all, it'd be great when you go into the small groups, please do put your videos on and introduce yourselves um, first. And then um, feel free, you have a, a you have a Jamboard there. So you can just cut and paste for those who are familiar with Jamboard, you'll put some uh, post-its on there and your suggestions or feel free to just discuss. We as the, the facilitators will be going around to your group and documenting your recommendations um, as to, to make sure that we can have those uh, presented back in the final, in the final debrief. So you'll have, uh, you'll have until about uh, 40, 15 minutes in the group for the group discussion. Uh, so Jessica, if we could just break the groups um, can you confirm we have about 30 participants? So how many groups? Yes, I've done, I've done five groups. Okay, great. Okay, so um, we'll see you all uh, in your groups. That'll take a, a minute to, to trickle back in. Okay, so for those of you who are um, coming back in with us, can I just ask you to feel free to add your recommendations in the chat on the side, and then we'll be starting to hear from each group. Uh, we had five groups, right, Jessica? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, actually one, group two, I moved because a few people didn't join, so it's actually four groups. One. Okay, four groups. Okay, great. So uh, let's hear just to wrap up because we are now um, pressed for time let's hear a quick uh, few minutes uh, uh, recommendations from each of the group um, so if we can hear from group one no you don't even know which groups you are <laughs> oh, okay that was Alexandra, Ellie, Hani, Ina, and Nabil. Okay. So 
why we are returned to this main room? We did not complete our discussion yet. <laughs> Time is finished, Jacob. <laughs> Yes, we're very sorry. That's that's the nature. We're running out of time. So we just had to bring you back in. I'm really sorry, Jacob. But please do feel free to continue um, afterwards with, with your participants. But it would be good because we're just, uh, we have a limited amount of time if we could hear from, from some of the colleagues, uh, some of the key recommendations that came out in your in your session. So I see that some colleagues are typing on, on the PowerPoint slide. So I wonder if maybe we could start with you, Lauren. I saw you were typing and I can show my screen. Lauren, would you be able to give a few updates from your side of some of the key recommendations that came out of the group you were in? No, oh, actually, I'm gonna hand over to Marion because she was in my group as well facilitating. Okay. If you're happy with that, Marion. <laughs> Please. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll uh, do a summary. So one of the key things that came out is uh, in terms of use of technology, we have to consider uh, even, sorry, um, yeah, we have to consider remote locations where technology might not be able to be support, like for example, use of WhatsApp, Teams and all those. So we have to consider, for example, the use of hotlines, the use of phones, um, so it's one of the things that uh, was recommended that in terms of the guidance notes that we develop, we have to consider other contexts uh, that use low technology. The other thing that came up is the use of ambulance, where we have to uh, put up measures and agree with the health colleagues in terms of how children can be safely moved uh, without even causing uh, further family separations. Um, there was also the recommendation on, on the use of uh, a personal protective equipment and emerging um, need, which we need to preposition, we have to budget, we have to fundraise in order to be able to support the foster carers in um, different, uh, different facilities, different contexts. Um, the other thing that came is um, the need for ongoing awareness and sensitization for foster carers, as some of them uh, of them tend to hold on these children, and when it comes to family reunification, sometimes they don't let the children uh, go. So this counseling and ongoing awareness for both the children and carers is really important for them to understand that at one point they can be linked with the uh, families. Uh, they, there was also a recommendation for ongoing identification and a training capacity building for additional foster carers within communities, not waiting for a pandemic, also as part of preparedness. Sorry, just yeah, yeah, hold on sorry. a second. If we can just uh, ask Jessica to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, two more points. Uh, so I highlighted ongoing identification, training and capacity building of foster parents, but also there was a recommendation to look beyond foster parents. For example, the community leaders in the refugee camps who also need to be trained. We need to look at religious leaders, other groups that can be helpful to provide alternative care during a pandemic. There was a recommendation also on simplification of context specific materials and tools that are context relevant and uh, which can be, uh, uh, which we have to make them as practical as possible to the lower level where the community volunteers and community case workers can be able to use. Um, the last one uh, is about importance of children, ongoing children consultation, children and adolescent consultations on their issues. What do they feel can be more appropriate? For example, when we were starting, there was the issue highlighted about independent living uh, how can adolescents be provided alternative safe care? So ongoing consultations and getting the children and adolescent views together with the youth can be helpful in, in terms of deciding which best alternative care can we use during a uh, disease outbreak. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So maybe to, to Jacob, which, would you be able to provide some of the key recommendations that came out of your group? In our group, we use Jamboard and Care was uh, putting the um, sticky notes on that. But I can, uh, Claire, you want to uh, read those or I can do it for the group? No, I'm happy for you to read them, Jacob. 
Okay, uh, in our group, we have come out uh, so far, we were able to capture four points as recommendation. One is need for clarity and increased functioning of best uh, interest determinant, the, the, uh, the process initiated by even um, ACR in Bangladesh. So that was, that was one of the recommendations from one of our participants who used to work in Cox's Bazaar now in Iraq. And also ring fencing, ring fencing funding that has not been spent due to COVID restrictions and ensure it is spent with priority on alternative care and child protection. The third uh, point uh, came out as ensure child protection initiatives in non-traditional humanitarian settings are also included and provided funding. And the last, not the least one, greater chance of infection in institutional settings, good motivation to look at alternative to institutions such as family reunification, family-based care, etc. Yeah, okay. those are the four points came out so far. Great, thank you. And I'm just going to hand to Cliff because we're really uh, running out of time, unfortunately. But over to you, Cliff. For wrap up, Amanda. I'm really sorry. Okay. Um... So we just have a few last words from Cliff and, and we'll make that the last intervention. Over to you, Cliff. Okay, so a couple of few uh, interesting points uh, came out. Uh, one is uh, to ensure that training for uh, families and potential caregivers has a COVID infectious disease uh, angle and how to deal with this uh, is quite critical, uh, the participants felt. Uh, they also uh, thought that uh, we need to strengthen our uh, social protection programming, uh, ensuring that uh, cash-based assistance uh, kind of uh, support is included in, uh, in both uh, prevention of uh, uh, separation as well as uh, responding to uh, caregivers who are care taking on uh, additional children to care for. Um, they all, uh, also felt that uh, perhaps uh, while it's challenging to identify uh, family-based care in the immediate uh, time, um, strengthening interim care arrangement with clear time frames for how long children should stay which should also be included. There were some additional points. Uh, if there is time, I can continue. Great, thank you. Well, it sounds like it was such a rich discussion. So I'm, um, really, I want to thank everyone for highlighting the aspects of three areas, the issue of prevention, how do we prevent family separation, the issue of how do we engage with communities and, and health actors, and also the importance of, of ensuring that our child protection services remain um, in place and accessible for those who really need it in the times of in COVID times as as life saving and essential services. So thank you very much. Um, I'll let Jessica tell you exactly how long. I believe we have about four minutes till the next session starts. So please um, grab a cup of coffee and and join us in the next session. Thank you very much to my presenters and to all the participants. And we'll see you in the next session. <laughs>